from the book of Psalms. Hear what God the Spirit is saying to you. O Lord God of my salvation, when at night I cry out in your presence, let my prayer come before you. Incline your ear to my cry, for my soul is full of troubles and my life draws near to Sheol. I am counted among those who go down to the pit. I am like those who have no help, like those forsaken among the dead, like the slain that lie in the grave, like those whom you remember no more, for they are cut off from your hand. You have put me in the depths of the pit, in the regions dark and deep. Your wrath lies heavy upon me, and you overwhelm me with all your waves. You have caused my companions to shun me. You have made me a thing of horror to them. I am shut in so that I cannot escape. My eye grows dim through sorrow. Every day I call on you, Lord. I spread out my hands to you. Do you work wonders for the dead? Do the shades rise up to praise you? Is your steadfast love declared in the grave or your faithfulness in Abaddon? Are your wonders known in the darkness or your saving help in the land of forgetfulness? But I, O oh Lord, cry out to you. In the morning, my prayer comes before you. O oh Lord, why do you cast me off? Here ends the reading of words that give us insight on God. May God grant us wisdom and courage for interpretation. Sing with me, holly, holly. Halle, 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 luia. Halle, 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 luia. Halle, 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 luia. Halleluja, halleluja. One more time. Well, for those who don't know me, uh, I am the Reverend Dale Suggs. I go by the pronouns he, him, his, and I live on the land of the Kumeyaay peoples. I have been blessed to preach here at University Christian Church at least three times before. I wish I had been counting. My family and I, uh, we're blessed to be members of UCC from 2006 through 2014. My wife Shelley served as co-chair of the elders. All four of my daughters preached senior sermons from that pulpit and they received academic scholarships from this congregation. Now I am blessed to preach here for the first time as part of the pastoral staff of University Christian Church. As your quote acting minister of congregational care, my ministry here is very part time. Um, you may know that in 2018, my wife Shelley and I founded a new Disciples of Christ community called Beloved San Diego. Our intention had been to um, locate a new Disciples congregation in North Inland San Diego along I-15 near the intersection of Highway 56. But you know, in our development, location was much less important than mission and identity. We long to be a progressive and yet contemplative 
community of faith, and we discovered we could do that almost anywhere, especially because we didn't own a building. And then COVID-19 hit, and location became pretty much irrelevant all together. We began, we, we, as, we, as we leave the pandemic, we, we are still small, but we have participants from all over California, in other states like Texas and Indiana and Illinois and New York and from other countries like Mexico, Canada, the United Kingdom, Spain, and for a moment there, Thailand. Location has so dropped off from our identity, we are in the process of dropping the word San Diego from our name. And then just this year, Shelly and I founded a new nonprofit called the Beloved Compassion Network. BCN, as we call it, is dedicated to helping congregations, nonprofit, governmental, and for profit organizations to become schools of compassion. And I'd love to tell you all about it, but we'll leave that for another day. You know, y'all look good. This is actually the biggest group of people I've seen in a very long time. It's good to be back. And I thank you for your warm welcome, your acceptance, and your inclusion again into the UCC family. It's always good to feel seen and heard and wanted. But I must admit, as much as I know I am seen and heard and wanted, I still ask myself questions. I ask, do you really see me? Do you really hear me? Do you really want me who I really am? Or do you want me as you expect me to be? Do you want to see, hear, and want all of this? Or would you rather just have what fits in your Zoom screen? <laughs> hmm. In the scripture that Joan read for us this morning, we encounter the pathos of human existence. The psalmist's lament is filled with pain and suffering and rejection and self-loathing and hopelessness, even to the point of death. It reads, you have caused my companions to shun me. You have made me a thing of horror to them. Do your works of wonder, do they matter to the dead? Is your steadfast love declared in the grave? Are your wonders known in the darkness? Are your saving is your saving help discovered in the land of forgetfulness? See, desperately pleading for God's help and finding no help from the beloved one in the moment in which this psalmist lives. The psalmist cries out again, I am counted among those who go down to the pit. I am like those who have no help, like the forsaken among the dead, like the slain that lie in the grave, like those whom you remember no more, for they are cut off from your hand. I cry out to you, O Lord, why do you cast me off? Well, why this text? Why am I re-entering the family with such a deep and troubling lament? Well, May is Mental Health Month, Mental Health Awareness Month, I should say. And on behalf of all of us who struggle with mental, emotional, mood, and neurological disorders, this is what our lives are like much of the time. If we walk past the doors of this church, seeing the latecomers scurry in, we turn our faces wondering, is God in there? 
if we touch the door handle and depress the latch release with our thumbs, we immediately let go and run away lamenting, even if God is in there, there is no place for me in there. If we open the door and walk in, we are greeted by smiling faces and hands extended, all the while thinking they wouldn't be smiling at us and most certainly wouldn't be reaching out to touch us if they knew the truth of who we are. If we sit down, we put on our best mask of pleasantry, morphing into what we believe is expected of us, sitting in an inconspicuous spot, hoping that no one notices the cracks in our facade, instinctively knowing they want us here, yes, but not as we are. God wants us here but only if we repent of the emotional turmoil that lives within us. And you know, if we stay, if we make it through the service, we don't look at the cross. We try not to listen to the words, for they are full of barbs that activate the turmoil within us. And as that turmoil grows, we, even with smiles on our face, are shaking our fist to God, saying, Oh Lord, we cry out to you, why do you cast us off? Well, you may have noticed that we switched to using the pronouns we and us and them and their after the introduction to this sermon. Did anybody catch that? Hmm. We are not using plural pronouns as an expression of a non-binary gender. And for those present or those listening at home whose true identity is expressed with we, they, them, and their, I pray you are not offended. And I apologize if my word usage seems insensitive, but we are speaking in the plural for other reasons. Let me share a few. First, we are using plural pronouns because there are a lot more people struggling with serious mental health issues out there than you may think. You probably have heard the statistic that is trotted out into public view every year in the month of May. One out of five people suffer from a mental health disorder. But that means that for the hundred gathered here today, and we're pretty close to a hundred, that's cool. For the hundred gathered here today in this sanctuary, that means that 20 of the people sitting around you are struggling with their mental health. But you know that one in five is pre-pandemic. Consider that. Consider what you've been through. Consider what we've been through. Consider what our world has been through and continues to struggle with even though we are kind of moving out. Though we have such privilege. In January 2021, the number of adults reporting symptoms of anxiety disorder or depressive disorder doubled to two in five. That means of this gathering, 40 of those sitting around you are struggling with serious mental health issues. For black and Hispanic or Latino adults, this number rose another 10%. That means half of us, 50. For young adults, 18 to 25, that number rises even another 10%. That would be three in five or 60 of us 
here this morning. And for special subgroups, these numbers have skyrocketed. If you think wondering, if you think the introduction of 100 anti transgender pieces of legislation in 33 states in this country don't have impact, transgender mental health concerns may affect four out of five. That would be 80 of us. That's a good reason to use plural. Plural pronouns all by itself. So many of us are struggling with mental health issues right now. That's one reason. The second reason we are using plural pronouns is because for every person who is struggling with their mental health, there is a family who struggles alongside of them. We lose sight of the families. Let's go to, with the low end of the pandemic statistics and say only two out of five of us is personally struggling with mental health issues. Now, we would wager then that four out of five of us have a family member or close friend who is struggling with their mental health right now. With a simple show of hands, who knows, has a family member or a close friend who's struggling with mental health right now? That's a good number of us. That might be four out of five, maybe just a little under. Hmm. Maybe it should be all of us. You know, maybe the fact that everyone doesn't have their hand up here in this space and at, out there in the virtual world is because collectively we here are very fortunate, very privileged in our life situations. Looking out at our demographic, I think that's very possible, but you know, it's more likely that we haven't all raised our hands because our family and close friends who struggle with their mental health are not willing to tell us what's really going on. And strikingly enough, one big reason they're not going to say anything is because we are church-going Christians. It's true. Which brings us to that third reason we are using plural pronouns this morning. We were first diagnosed with a depressive or mood disorder in the mid 1990s. 90s. In our ministry, we share this reality only with a very small controlled group of elders and board members. Now, by the time we came to California in 1997, struggling with depression from time to time was how I would put it, uh, became more a part of my story with elders and with church board members but not with everyone. This was not something we shared openly. And quite honestly, it's amazing how really well our reality remained a secret in these congregations. How is that even possible? You know, that secrecy was supposedly a good exercise in maintaining confidentiality, but in reality, we received it as yet another reason to believe that if it ever got out to everyone who we really are, our job, our career would be over. And don't even ask me about telling other disciples of Christ pastors or regional ministers or general level. <sighs> Couldn't risk that. Way too dangerous. 
You know, after leaving our ministry at Torrey Pines Christian Church in 2005, we entered a period of deep depression that was surprisingly followed by a period of euphoric feelings and high energy and really undue confidence. That manic state came crashing down on a Friday evening in July of 2007. And for the next week, Um, we were housed in the locked ward at Mesa Vista Hospital. The new diagnosis, bipolar disorder. We hate that diagnosis. <laughs> bipolar disorder. The stigma around this diagnosis and so many other diagnoses leaves people both unnerved when they hear it and a little bit scared for their own safety. I saw the in the room when I said the words. We hate that diagnosis, bipolar. We hate the medication that comes with it even more. The side effects can be intolerable. We stay on our meds, my wife Shelly makes perfectly sure that we stay on our meds, but we understand those with mental and emotional and neurological disorders who stop taking their meds and then start self-medicating with alcohol, drugs, or some other chosen way not to feel the way we feel or just to feel anything at all. Quick quiz. I've already told you the third reason why we are using plural pronouns this morning. Did anybody catch it? I got one nodding head over there. Hang on to that. Here's a clue. We were talking with Patty Gilchrist on Tuesday of this week, and we mentioned in passing that we struggle with bipolar disorder. Yes, we talk about our mental health struggles pretty openly anymore. For one thing, we are no longer on the ministry career ladder. It took me 30 years to figure out that ministry was, wasn't even a career. <sighs> they told me in seminary it was, they were wrong. <laughs> and more than that, we are really too old now to care what you think. Amen. <laughs> well, we care a little. <laughs> but not enough to not talk about what's really going on. Hmm. And for those young people within the, within the sound of my voice who are struggling with their own mental health, believe it or not, half of the battle is surviving long enough to figure this out. Surviving long enough to find the people and the doctors and the medications and the sports groups and, yes, the spiritual practices that we need to thrive. It's different than for other folks. And there's a lot of trial and error involved, but it can happen. It will happen. And if you're struggling with it, call me. Let's talk. Well, back to Patty. I was talking to her on Tuesday, and I mentioned that in passing, and she called me back on Wednesday and said that she never knew that we struggled with bipolar disorder. I, you know, I missed, that, I missed that plural a second ago. Patty called us back on Wednesday and said that she never knew that we struggled with bipolar disorder, and that's absolutely true she never knew. And yet, 
When we entered that locked unit at Mesa Vista Hospital in 2007, we had been a week in and week out worshiping, homeless breakfast fixing, and committee serving member of this. We never told anyone what was really going on. Not even the pastors. The perceived stigma was too great. The risk too high. The fear too strong. Can you see it now? Why I'm using plural pronouns? At the darkest point in my life, I, singular, was a member of this church, plural. And that's what makes my story and my family's story, singular, into our story, plural. My story, <laughs> by default, is part of your story, too. Even though you never knew about it, we were in it together simply because we weren't in it together. You know, the American church as a whole, and until very recently, even in progressive churches like this one and beloved San Diego, who focuses a lot on mental illness because... You got me. <clears throat> but even in progressive churches, mental illness is stigmatized as either a result of sin, a lack of faith, demonic influence, praying the wrong way. That's the one that really ticks me off. <laughs> or just not praying enough. Think about it. If I am... Mentally ill, I'm either sinful, faithless, possessed, lazy, or all of the above. Take your pick. The statistics say that 30% of Protestant Christians believe evil spirits play a role in mental illness. 30% of Protestant Christians believe Bible reading, praying, and confession are the most effective, effective treatments for depression. In 2007, a survey at Stanford revealed that one-third of the participants had been directly told that their mental illness was a result of personal sin. Best-selling books by Joel Osteen, Joyce Meyer, Nancy Lee Demos, Beth Moore, and others reference demonic possession as the cause of mental illness and a full two-thirds of people in psychiatric institutions those who made it into that locked ward like me fully two-thirds of them report being told by a religious professional that they are possessed by a demon and when we end this service today and I make my little recession to the back of the church, people are going to come by and talk to me at the door, or they're going to send me an email or a text commending me on my bravery for speaking up about my bipolar depression. You know, just like your pastor's wife, Shauna, she's been called brave for talking about her postpartum depression. And as much as I appreciate that, I really do, and I'm sure Shauna appreciates it as well. Why do we need to be brave? Why do we have to be brave to enter this hallowed space and be surrounded by the sacred community? Not as the people you expect us to be, but instead as the persons we really are. Why do, 
why do we feel that you really do want me here, but you really don't want all of me to come along for the ride? The psalmist who poured out his anguish in our scripture reading this morning laid their pain unto death truth before God and the whole congregation. So welcome were the psalmist's raw words of lamentation that not only were they seen and heard, heard and held and wanted, but also they were memorialized as among the holiest of holy words ever spoken. They're in the Bible, for God's sake. The psalmist was not commended for being brave. The psalmist was celebrated for being faithful. There's so much more to say here. I'm already running long, and you know, I'm going to run longer. Because <laughs> I don't get to do this very often. <laughs> There's a whole list of things that we, this gathering, and we, the virtual gathering, can do to demonstrate to anyone who walks in those doors or anyone who watches at home that this holy space is brave space, where their whole selves, including their struggles with mental health, are wholly wanted. There are things we can do. We can acknowledge the problem. We can name the stigma. We can learn about mental health and the struggles faced by individuals and their families. We can adopt a whole person understanding to mental health treatment, including doctors and counselors and medications and family and friends and support groups, and yes, absolutely, without doubt, spiritual practices. The whole person. We can get clear that healing doesn't happen when we're out there on our own. Healing only happens when we are in the midst of community. We can make it clear that individuals and families struggling with mental health are welcome and wanted, and we can do that in every publication, every gathering, every holy day decor, every month of the year, not just May. We can embody welcoming and wanting people who are struggling by including them and their families as scripture readers, committee members, event planners, board members, elders. Maybe because of what they bring to the table. Most of all, the most impactful thing I, I <laughs> we, the most impactful thing we believe that we can do is get honest about what's really going on with us who are already here already in this virtual space. In other words, we can make this personal. You know, there's a story told of Jesus in the New Testament of a woman who had been suffering for 12 years with an issue of blood, and she had gone to doctors and found no help there. In fact, they had made her worse, and she had become an outcast in her community. She was meant to live apart from everybody else, and if she went out in public, she had to keep her distance from everybody else because she was unclean, and to touch her would be to make yourself unclean. And she hears that Jesus is in town. In fact, he's on his way to, um, let me see if we get the name right, Jairus' house to heal his daughter. And she thinks to herself, you know, if I can only talk to him, if he could touch me, if I could just touch him, 
if I could just touch the hem of his robe, I know that I can be made whole. What if the church was like that? What if the church was like that for individuals like me and families like mine who struggle with mental health? What if we thought to ourselves, if I could only just stay through a worship service, if we could just sit down on a pew, if we could just open the door, if we could just touch the door handle and depress the latch release with our thumbs, if we could just walk by on the sidewalk, no, the sidewalk on the far side of the street, and drink in the spirit that emanates from that holy space, then, 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 we could begin to heal. What if the church was seen like that? That, my friends, is the church we're called to be. Normally at our Hymn of Commitment, we do a traditional one, but we want to teach a song today because it goes right with what Reverend Dale has been speaking to us and Marcella read. It's just called Come As You Are. mercy or children come near earth has no sorrow that heaven can't heal earth has no sorrow that heaven can heal so lay down your burden lay down your shame all who are broken lift up your home you're not too far so lay down your hurt lay down your heart come as you are there's hope for the hopeless and all those who've strayed come sit at the table Come taste the grace. There's rest for the weary, rest that is real. Earth has no sorrow that heaven can't heal. So lay down your burden, lay down your shame. All who are broken, lift up your Wander, come home. You're not too far. So lay down your hurt, lay down your heart, come as you are. Well, there's joy for the morning, or oh, children be still. Earth has no sorrow that heaven can't heal. Earth has no sorrow that heaven can. Why don't you stand as we sing it one last time? So lay down your burdens, lay down your shame. All who are broken, all who are broken, lift up your. So lay down 
your hurt, lay down your heart, come as you are. So lay down your hurt, lay down your heart, come as you are.